Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to the, the first session of our disability history event main event. We are delighted to be bringing you a variety of different sessions over the course of today and indeed next week and over the coming weeks as well. Um, we have a great programme of activities going on and I will share these in the chat as well so that if there are additional sessions you want to attend today, you can do. Um, what we are focusing on today is being disability confident. Okay, now this applies whether you are the manager of, of a colleague that has a disability, a disabled person yourself, somebody that works with disabled students, a colleague of a disabled person. So it matters to everybody. And we're really looking forward today to sharing with you some of the great work that's going on behind the scenes within the disability staff network to support the inclusion of disabled staff here at the university. And we're really excited that we've got a variety of different speakers joining us, including Laura, who we're gonna hand over to shortly, um, Hamid from the National Association of Disabled Staff Networks. Um, and then we have panelists that will be attending on the 8th of December, a My Career Journey special. So if you haven't seen those events, I'll make sure to pop those in the chat too, including Ian Johns, the current Paralympic judo coach, um, and Rachel Murray, an asthma advocate. I'm going to just hand over to my colleague from my co-chair of the Disabled Staff Network, Julian Gwinnett, who's just going to share a few reflections before we get started and then we'll hand over to Laura. Hello and welcome. My name is Julian. I'm like Mel and I'm also one of the co-chairs here at the University of Wolverhampton. I should start by saying that there's no getting away from it. There's been troubling times for disabled people over the last decade or so. We've had uh, a, almost a decade long of austerity, which has had quite a disproportionate impact on the disabled community. And we're looking forward to, I'm looking forward to, I mean, fearing another round to come that will equally affect us more than most. Um, I would also like to say as well, this, that normally this, these events are, are done to coincide with the United Nations International Day for Persons with a Disability, which is usually celebrated on the 3rd of December each year, which this year unfortunately falls on a Saturday. So this was the early state in the calendar for, which to, for us to actually convene these a series of events. It also coincides with World AIDS Day an event that seems to have drifted off in terms of the consciousness, in terms of significance. And yet it's something that continues to sort of affect people globally. Um, and many of the people alive today, and thankfully they are alive today because med medical advances uh, are living with some form of disability. And there are the parallels there with, with COVID as we know, because COVID has also had a disproportionate impact on disabled community in terms of deaths but also as well the numbers of people now who are living with a form of lot with long covid which is something we still don't fully understand in terms of the long-term health implications for them um but it's today's not just really about looking at the past or, and, and also like acknowledging where we are in the present it's also about thinking towards the future and and what that future might look like. Um, but, and we are here today to sort of like discuss some of the ideas, some of the thoughts, some of the actions, some of the plans that are actually gonna be part of forming that future from the speakers we have here today, but also at other events throughout the course of Disability History Month here at the university. Um, but also what we're also doing within our institution itself. We will learn more about that later. Um, but also to find to finish off with, this, this isn't just a, a time to think about exclusively about disabled people or even sort of like inclusivity in general. It's also to think about how this is a conversation that involves absolutely everybody because how we build an inclusive world is a really, really important question that all of us should be part of in terms of determining what the answer is. Because a better world for everybody is also a better world for disabled people, that goes without saying. And we should all be part of, of that conversation. And I think at that point, I'd like to hand over to Laura now who will begin this morning's presentation. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. That's fantastic, Laura. That's all operational. 
Okay, so I'd just like to start by saying I'm not very well today, so I'll do my best not to cough constantly. Um, and also just some feedback from the previous um, presentations I've done, just to put a small trigger warning on for pre and post natal depression and mental health. So, um, hi, I'm Laura Wood and I'm here today to talk to you about becoming a mother to a child of a disability and our journey so far. So who am I? So professionally, I'm Laura Wood and I'm service manager for the Children, Young People and Leaving Care Service in Wolverhampton, which is a 0 to 25 service made up of young people in care and care leavers. I've predominantly worked with children in care and care leavers, as well as the fostering service. And I've been an advanced practitioner, a practice educator, a team manager, and now I'm service manager. Personally, I'm Laura Cutler, a mother and stepmother to three boys and a girl, um, a friend and a wife. Uh, I love to be busy and I'm really sociable. And I think that's important for this presentation because you'll, you'll see as we go on. So usually I would start with a Mentimeter, but I'm aware of time and I don't want to um, run out. So I'm going to skip this bit and go straight into the presentation. So the journey for me and my family. So in 2021, in the middle of the second lockdown, uh, I found out I was pregnant for the second time. It was a planned pregnancy and I had a very good pregnancy, a lot less concerns than with my first pregnancy. I did, however, keep saying to my best friend that I was worried that something just wasn't quite right. And at each scan, I was almost terrified to attend. At 28 weeks pregnant, my mother-in-law asked me if I was having another large baby, as I had with my boy, um, because I looked like I was measuring as big. Compared the pictures side by side and realised that she was right. So at 29 weeks pregnant, at a routine midwife appointment, I pointed out my size um, and asked her to measure me, and she agreed that I was right, I was measuring big again. So she called the hospital for an emergency scan, which is basic protocol, and I was booked in for the next day. Uh, it was a Wednesday and my husband was not allowed to attend because of COVID, but I was calm and collected compared to last time because I'd been through it before. Uh, during the uh, scan, the scanographer kept coming in and out of the room. She went really quiet with me and her facial expression completely changed. Um, it was at this point I knew something wasn't quite right and I became very distressed. Um, she informed me that our baby's limbs were measuring uh, shorter than they should be and I'd need to see a consultant, but unfortunately the consultant wouldn't be available for another week. Uh, she asked me if I'd had the test for Down syndrome. I said I had and it was low risk and her parting phrase to me was low risk doesn't mean no risk and kindly asked me to leave the hospital while I was sobbing and um, with no information or support. I did what we all do and we shouldn't do. I spent the entire night Googling um, and two main medical conditions came up, um, Down syndrome and dwarfism. To be honest, I discounted dwarfism straight away because we're both average height. Um, I presumed it was in in heritage, sorry. Um, as I thought it was really rare because I'd only ever seen it on the TV. So that night I thought, I can't do this. I can't wait a week. So I thought I'm gonna have to go into service manager mode. So I contacted the hospital the next day and made a formal complaint. And I was offered an appointment within three hours. And the consultant wasn't happy. He was in a rush. He made that point abundantly clear, but he did complete the scan. And he said that he was ruling out dwarfism because of my early test, which showed a low risk and because the bones were white and not yellow. He did say, however, that he was concerned that our baby may have dwarfism. But the good news was he could already tell it wasn't the lethal type, which, to be honest, just blew my mind at that point. Um, he advised us that it was a non-intrusive blood test we could do to ascertain if the baby had the condition but it would take 10 days to come back as it needed to go to a specialist lab. And they couldn't do it on that specific day because they didn't have the paperwork available. 
and I was asked to go back to the hospital tomorrow. I'll keep this bit brief because it was an absolute nightmare. Um, that day, I had a call from the hospital to say they had discovered they'd got the tests and the paperwork and could I come back in. So literally just dropped my shopping in the middle of Argos and went to the hospital. Um, I was made to wait in a side room for 45 minutes and then I was asked for a payment of £250. So when I queried that, they informed me that people who need a test for Down syndrome have to pay £250, to which I replied that I wasn't there for that, I was there for a test for dwarfism. They apologised that there'd been a mix up and asked me to go back tomorrow. So on the Friday, I called several times because nobody contacted me. Um, and they advised that they couldn't do the test because we were going into the weekend and the blood wouldn't get from Telford to Birmingham to London in time. So could I return on Monday? So I returned on Monday. They took the blood for the blood test and the 10 day clock started ticking. However, on the Wednesday, I had an urgent call to say could I go back to the hospital because unfortunately they hadn't taken enough blood. So the clock started ticking again. Um, I'd read a lot around the medical concerns at this point that were associated with dwarfism and I'd ended up going off work sick because I just couldn't function in the service manager role because it's a lot of chairing meetings and being front facing. Um, I spent the majority of the time crying um, and all Christmas shopping because I knew if I didn't do it there I probably wouldn't do it after we'd had the test results if they were positive. Um, it was day six and we were sitting at the dinner table with three boys and the phone rang. Um, I'd literally jumped out my skin for the whole six days previous to that. And even though it was out of hours, my heart sunk because I just knew it would be the consultant. It was the consultant and he advised us that our baby did have chondroplasia, which is the common form of dwarfism. He asked me if we were aware of all the medical conditions that were associated with the condition. I was because I had not stopped Googling, um, but my husband had no idea. Um, I watched the colour drain from his face. And the only way I can explain it really is that we were both speechless. And looking back, it was definite shock. Um, I couldn't speak. I was just overwhelmed with fear because of all that I'd read. The consultant advised us that he'd got minimal knowledge of the condition and that he'd refer us to a respiratory consultant and an orthopaedic consultant who'd had a few patients with the condition. Um, I begged them to phone me as soon as possible. So in hindsight, I would say it was at this point that the grief cycle kicked in, something which I think we all need to be aware of when we're working with children, young people, staff, um, I think we need an understanding that the grief cycle isn't just associated with death. Uh, it's associated with lots of forms of loss, um, which people can experience in many different ways. I'm not sure I was in the denial stage, but I was certainly numb um, and I wasn't quite processing what was going on. The anger stage didn't take long to kick in. The why me dedicated my life to helping people like technically looking after 800 young people at any one time. Um, I'd taken on my husband's twins as my own and had joint custody and would look after them when he was on shift. And at that point, it just seemed really unfair. Um, it was at this point that I fluctuated from a really, really distressed mother to a very assertive service manager. Um, me and my husband are the total opposite in the way we deal with issues. So I was now on a mission to find out everything I absolutely could about this condition, whereas he just didn't speak. Um, my younger brother has got Crohn's disease and my family had utilised them when he was first diagnosed. So I did some Googling and I found a brilliant um, charity called the Restrictive Growth Association. They were completely amazing. Um, they got an average height mother to phone me who had a baby with a chondroplasia. And they added me to a Facebook group called Small and Tall Here for All. And this is where I started to gather my information. And I learned that in these situations, it really is um, parents that are the experts. So 
So these are all the different questions that were going around my head and nobody really had any answers. Um, the respiratory consultant did contact me around week six. So that's a very long time when you're distressed. Um, he explained his role in the orthopaedic role. Um, however, for a distressed mother, he was extremely laid back. Um, I had many questions that he just couldn't answer or that he could half answer when prompted. So, for example, I asked if there was any specialist equipment I would need to get for my child and he, to which he answered no. And then when I prompted him about car seats, he was like, oh, yeah, there is something about life like car seats. So it, it's just up in my anxiety as we go. So I was very nervous about opening up to the midwife and the GP. As a service manager, I know it's really important that it's a strength, but that it was also nerve wracking because of that. Um, but this stage, I was desperately begging for some resources, some counselling, just any support in general, really. Um, I was eventually referred for a perinatal mental health assessment. Um, and that deemed that I didn't have a mental health issue. I was just having a reactive reaction to some significant concerning news. So at this point, I wasn't offered any alternative support. I was allocated a um, specialist emotional well-being health visitor. But for those of you who've been involved with health visitors, they usually come on board once the child's here. So it was at this point I became really entrenched in the grief cycle. I just didn't know this at the time, but just couldn't see a way out. And um, I got no information or communication as the condition was so rare and no one knew enough about it. Um, I called current and previous colleagues from the disability service who'd had 25 years plus experience and they'd never come across this condition. Had no physical or emotional support because we were in COVID. And some people shied away from me. And for those that didn't, the only way they could access me was by a phone, which I just didn't have the energy for. The idea of FaceTiming after being on the phone all day Googling or phoning professionals just did not appeal to me. Um, and in hindsight, I would say it was at this point I was grieving for the life I thought we'd have and the life we'd given the other three boys. Um, whilst trying to continue to act really happy and meet their needs, so my emotional battery was completely drained. I was really lucky at this point because I saw a Facebook post from a mother whose daughter was on a clinical trial. And she said she was happy to speak to anybody who wanted any more information about this. So I contacted her, not because I wanted information about the clinical trial, but I just wanted information about the chondroplasia because there wasn't any. Um, she directed me to a specialist consultant and the consultant contacted me. The amount of information she gave me in 45 minutes was unbelievable. I felt like I knew what I needed, when I needed it, and how support should run. Um, and I'll never forget that act of kindness because she didn't have to do that. She was in London, I was in Telford. So um, what did I learn? So I learned a lot of things that I didn't know about dwarfism. So I'll talk through a few of them. So there's actually 200 different types of dwarfism. And 80% of people born with dwarfism are actually born to average height parents. It's a result of a spontaneous mu mutation at conception. And the majority of parents don't know they're expecting a child with dwarfism until the child's actually born because it doesn't show up on the 20 week scan in the majority of cases. And most people don't have a scan after 20 weeks. Um, one in 25,000 babies are born with a chondroplasia, and there's around 7,000 in the UK. Um, I think a lot of people think dwarfism is just about height, but there's lots of medical conditions which can arise, which I'll discuss later. And dwarfism does not affect intellectual disability. Dwarfism would have a typical average intelligence. So there's two main types of dwarfism proportionate and disproportionate so proportionate is when the body's all in proportion but it's just shortened and the most common form of dwarfism which is chondroplasia 
is disproportionate to dwarfism where the torso is average height, but the person has shortened legs and arms. So I just put this slide in because I wish somebody had shown me this when we got diagnosed because I could not say chondroplasia for months. Um, but you'll find a lot of people in the community, dwarfism community, would call it ACON. So how does it affect the body? So as I said earlier, it's not, it doesn't affect cognitive ability or intelligence. It simply affects a normal skeletal development in the body. And that's when a, a mutation happens at conception. And then the final height for average females with dwarfism can be around 4'1". It can be a lot smaller though. And I don't really like this word, but there's no cure for dwarfism, but most people live long and fulfilling lives. So some of the characteristics. So this picture here is actually a set of twins. So this twin doesn't have a chondroplasia and this twin does. So it might be hard to tell over Zoom, but um, you'll notice there's an average size torso, but shortened upper arms and shortened upper legs. Um, an enlarged head with a prominent forehead, a flattened bridge of the nose and um, trident hands, which are like shaped like starfish. And what are the medical, potential medical conditions? So it's reduced muscle tone and delay. There's um, breathing problems in 50% of people affected with a chondroplasia or dwarfism. There's curvature of the spine, bowing of the legs, and um, one of the other common ones is recurring ear infections. So it's hearing loss in 68% of people affected, as well as the other things that you can see on the screen. So these were the main uh, worrying things for infants, which just sent me into a mad panic as a parent. So um, the Magna Forum can um, be compressed. So it's the um, brainstem that leads into the spinal cord and that can narrow and compress, which causes pressure on the brain and spine. And that's normally diagnosed via an MRI. And one of the common symptoms for that is sleep apnea. Um, there's curvature of the spine, um, and that's thought to be due to low muscle tone, enlarging head and flexible ligaments. And one of the real scary ones is um, sleep apnea. So obviously that can be where um, the brain temporarily stops sending signals to the muscles that control the breathing, and people can um, have bouts of not breathing in their sleep. So just put this chart in just to show um, when the different issues may occur, because some um, issues occur a lot in the infancy and some are later on in life. So infancy is a really important time to watch out for these complications. In the first year of life, an infant with a chondroplasia may need a lot of extra attention and closer medical supervision. In the early years, there's a huge medical team which looks at neurological and respiratory um, complications. Um, and it may take a bit longer for the development of milestones, but it will happen. And their child is likely to achieve them in their own times. And it's important to remember that every child's journey is different and not to be too panicked by that. And then as the child becomes an adult, you'll see they might outgrow some of the um, the early complications, but then they might have other issues such as back and leg pain, um, difficulty moving around, which can affect their everyday life. Just got a short video here, um, which goes into more detail. Chondroplasia is a rare bone condition and Sorry. is one of the most common skeletal dysplasias. It causes short arms and legs, particularly in relation to the trunk and head. The average height in adults is about 1.31 meters in men and 1.24 meters in women. On average, a chondroplasia occurs in one in every 25,000 births. There may be about 350,000 individuals with a chondroplasia around the world, 
However, the real number is not known, as there is no international registry, only some regional and hospital-based registries collecting data on a chondroplasia. 80% of cases occur in families with no history of a chondroplasia. On the other hand, a man or woman with a chondroplasia has a 50% chance of passing the genetic mutation to their children. A chondroplasia is caused by a mutated gene that is responsible for the production of a protein called fibroblast growth factor receptor 3. FGFR3 inhibits multiplication of chondrocytes, the cells that exist on the growth plates of the long bones. The mutated FGFR3 continuously inhibits the chondrocytes development, which drastically reduces bone growth. There are several complications associated to a chondroplasia that can occur, especially in children, such as foramen magnum stenosis, which is when the medulla at the base of the skull is compressed. Also, sleep apnea or recurrent otitis media, which can lead to hearing loss. Babies with a chondroplasia take much longer to reach developmental goals, such as sitting or walking alone, due to the disproportion between limbs and the larger head size. To reduce the frequency of complications, children and adults should have multidisciplinary follow-up, ideally by experienced healthcare professionals. In some circumstances, individuals should be referred to hospital centers with specific clinics for skeletal dysplasias. There is no cure for a chondroplasia. However, some innovative medicines are being explored, and some clinical trials are in progress. These treatments may only have a positive effect during periods of bone growth. Some individuals may undergo surgical limb lengthening to increase height, which has significant periods of recovery time. Arm lengthening is also possible. These procedures may start as early as 8 years old, but in many countries from the age of 12. Cognitive development is normal, yet due to physical differences, individuals with a chondroplasia tire more easily. It is important to support their independence by making adaptations at school, at home, and at work. They may also face various social challenges, and it is essential to build up self-esteem from an early age. Developing coping skills and providing psychological support is important, especially for close family members too. For more information on clinical guidance, medicines and development, and lifelong resources, please visit our website Beyond a Chondro... Thank you. So who might be involved? So actually, my daughter has all of these people involved with her. So this is just a list. So um, if people are lucky, they'll have a specialist for chondroplasia, um, a community paediatrician, respiratory paediatrician, um, physiotherapist, occupational therapist. The list goes on. Um, and what tests can be involved? So all children will need an MRI to screen for the magnoforum stenosis, overnight sleep studies to screen for sleep apnea, ECGs, and there's two scales down here which are significant. So um, none of my midwives knew about chondroplasia, but there's a special insert that should go into the red book, and there's a special development screening tool. As I said earlier, child's developmental milestones will be different to that of their peers, but they will get there and they'll find their own way of moving around. This is um, the chart that we look at. So the arrow is when an average height young person might meet their milestones. And then these sections here are when a child with a chondroplasia might meet them. And these are all um, ways that they might get around. This one here, really freaks my, uh, my mum out. <laughs> so as I said earlier, um, a child with a chondroplasia might have a curvature of the spine. So it's actually recommended that they should lie flat for as much as possible in the first 12 months of their life. Um, because that will mean that um, the curvature doesn't set. Um, there will be times when sitting in this is necessary. That's usually at meal or bath times and there should be um, specialist seating provided, which will give support to the spinal, spinal column. So just thought this was useful if you're working with anybody with a chondroplasia or supporting anybody. So the do's and don'ts.
um, which I've gone through some of them. And these are all the lovely things that I thought I would use with my child, but all of these are a no-go. So you can see here that these encourage curvature of the spine um, and or lack of neck, neck and back support. So the emotional struggle. So uh, approximately 36 weeks pregnant, my hospital was all over the national news for hundreds of baby deaths and or lifetime injuries, mainly for consultants pushing mothers to have a natural birth rather than a C-section. I remember sitting downstairs watching the news, sobbing and rocking back and forth in my rocking chair, um, completely terrified. I've been advising the consultant that babies with a chondroplasia have had enlarged heads, which makes it more difficult to have a natural birth. Um, but my consultant was insistent that I'd be able to have a natural birth because I'd had one with my first child and my daughter's head was not over the top of the uh, measurement chart. Um, I did have to remind him that they'd have to use instruments with Samuel because I had had a very difficult labour and I was only one push away from a C-section, in their words. Um, again, luckily, I had the London consultant, so I contacted her who was advising that you must not use instruments with babies with a chondroplasia due to the low muscle tone in their neck and spine. At this point, I just felt completely helpless again and very untrusting of health professionals. Felt desperately lonely. And um, it sounds extreme, but at times I just I just felt like there was no meaning, um, which was a very scary place to be. Uh, I cried constantly for the majority of the day. And if I wasn't crying, I was chasing professionals. So on the 6th of the 1st, 2021, Gabriella Jane was born via plan C-section. The neonatal team were in standby in the room and the whole team was fabulous. I was terrified, but they were amazing. Um, Ella's birth went extremely well and there were no complications. And I fell in love with her straight away, which I feel awful to say now, but that had been a huge fear of mine because I've, you know, in hindsight, I was so depressed. Um, she was beautiful and she was ours. Um, we were in hospital for three days before discharge. Um, and I'd made sure before discharge that we'd had all the referrals to the respiratory consultant, the orthopaedic consultant, Birmingham Specialist Clinic, and she'd had an ultrasound on the brain. This should have happened, but I know 100% this would not have happened if I hadn't have had the information from the London consultant. So what did we need at this point in time? We needed practical support, practical items. Um, I needed empathy and understanding. I remember going from, I remember going and standing in one of my friend's gardens and she hugged me so tightly and cried. And I just knew that she genuinely felt the pain that we were going through at that point. I had another friend who'd been a colleague of mine years ago and um, she literally stalked me to the point of annoyance. Um, but I think it's because she had a background in mental health. And even though we were only texting, I think she was significantly worried about me and refused to give up on me. Um, we needed information. We needed someone to provide us with information about the condition, what it meant, what we needed to do so, to support Ella. I felt like I was shouting from the rooftops and nobody was listening. Had an appointment with a respiratory consultant at around week eight, and he advised me that he'd do an MRI and a sleep study if he felt it was needed. But everything I'd read said it was needed and it was needed urgently. Um, Ella was a difficult baby. She had a milk allergy, um, which luckily I knew because her sibling had had one. So that was another fight for a diagnosis. Um, she's got a huge lump on her neck, which was a rare um, birthmark, which was connected to blood vessels. Um, obviously, we didn't know that at the time, so it's really scary to see that. And again, we had to really argue to get a diagnosis for that. Um, I'd say it was at this point that I was definitely in the depression stage of the cycle. 
um, a mood disorder that is a persistent feeling of sadness and loss of interest. Luckily for me, my work provided private counselling and after a lot of persuasion from friends, I went to the doctors and was um, prescribed antidepressants. Um, this was a huge deal for me because um, my mom had actually been on them for 25 years plus um, and I was scared I wouldn't come off them like her. But I also didn't want my children to feel the way I'd felt at times when my mum wasn't, wasn't well. So during this period, the London consultant stayed in touch and reviewed Ella via Teams regularly, which I appreciate so much as she was the only professional I really trusted at this point. Um, and we started to discuss the option of a clinical trial. Um, there was one trial left which was for a certain drug that aided growth in children with achondroplasia. Um, the children needed to be under one and they needed to have some narrowing of the magnaforum as the trial was to see if taking the drug would stop those babies having significant um, surgery on the brain. Um, the trial is very controversial. There's three camps. There's camp one, which is why do you not love your child for who they are and why, why are you trying to make people with dwarfism extinct? Um, camp two is we completely understand why you consider it, but it's not for us. And camp three is um, it's tested. It's about to go on the medical market. Why wouldn't we do this if it allowed our child to have um, access to more things in life and a better quality life? So me and my husband, after a lot of agonising conversations and emotional emotions decided that we would explore this. And it wasn't because we didn't love Ella for who she was. It was because we were really significantly concerned about SIDS and the narrowing of the Magnaforum. We also wanted Ella to be able to do things when she went to school, like wipe her bum for herself, put her hair in a ponytail, reach work surfaces. So it's in the July, Ella was about six months old. Um, we'd still not had a sleep study or an MRI, both of which she would get if we went to see if she was um, eligible for this medical trial. So me and my husband were like, we're going to do it because worst case scenario or best case scenario, we'll, we'll know what's going on with her medically. And we were struggling to get that support. So we're at Stafford waiting to get the train to London, Houston. Um, my partner's not allowed to come because of COVID-19. Uh, I've just had to leave Samuel for two days. So I've literally cried all the way from Telford to Stafford. Um, I've left him overnight before, but only for one night. And obviously we haven't been anywhere for 18 months. So he's just been with me. Um, I know it's the right thing to do for Ella to go to the Evelina but it's difficult when you're on your own and you've got a pram and a massive suitcase um, and watching your daughter be put to sleep with no emotional support but I know she needs the MRI and I know she needs a sleep study and at least we'll have some answers after that so I would say that London is the hardest thing I've ever had to do for many reasons. It was an absolute nightmare getting on the train and they told me I wasn't allowed assistance. So I had to try and get Ella on the train myself. The pram got stuck between the train and the track. Um, Ella was nose diving towards the train track. I lost her bottle. The conductor shouted at me. Um, they told me to get on the wrong side of the train so there wasn't um, disabled seats. And obviously she had to lie flat at that point. So the pram was nowhere near a seat. It, it was a nightmare. Um, when I got to London, the instructions on the letter were wrong. So we went to the wrong hospital. And because of COVID, the queue to get in the lift was like a theme park queue. <laughs> so I kept going up and down. We were late for the appointment. It was, it was a disaster. 
Um, we spent four hours with the consultant and the sleep study started at 6 p.m. I had to stay in the dark room by myself with nothing to do. Um, Ella was covered in wires which kept falling out, had no sleep all night. And then at 6 a.m. they just basically put the lights on and said, right, off you go. So literally had nowhere to go in London with a starved baby. Um, the MRO took place. Um, I watched them put her to sleep and then I was asked to leave for two hours. Um, when I returned back, she had to be monitored for about four hours. I uh, couldn't leave her. I couldn't go to the toilet. I had no food, no drink. It was all these things really that really impacted um, my emotional health and well-being, I'd say. Could, I could cry thinking about it now, to be honest, but um, ultimately, I really wanted to know if she was going to have SIDS and the narrowing of the Magnaforum. So I've just had a call from the Evelina and I feel ridiculous for crying. But Ella's MRI is completely fine. She's grade one, which if you'd asked me at 38 weeks pregnant, I would have said to you, my biggest fear is the MRI. I just want that to be okay in the sleep study. So I know I should be really grateful. And I am, because she's perfect and she's well. But I guess just because of society, I just wanted her to have the drug. Just silly things really, like going to school with arms that are long enough to wipe a bum. So um, I tried lots of strategies to try and um, support my emotional well-being. One of them was setting up an email account and emailing Ella. Um, another one was starting a Facebook page um, for mothers who were in my situation. So they'd know what to expect. They'd know what was needed when it was needed. And it did start off being quite cathartic. But to be honest, it took all my energy to keep up with life. And so I actually forgot about these videos um, until I was doing this presentation. And this was so powerful for me watching it back because I could see that. I was broken and I can see how far our family's come with the right support and the right knowledge. Um, to be honest, the next 12 months continue to be a struggle. Um, as I said earlier, um, when you're weaning a baby with a contraplasia, you need a specialist seat. I had to fight for that. I had to put in complaints to the local authority. Nobody would give us a seat. They said that there was no funding because she was under two. Um, she is 24 months now. We didn't get a buffet till 22 months. Um, I could talk about it forever. Um, but I want to, to also raise awareness on the actual condition. So, um, the other things that I found out was about, um, acceptable and not exceptional terminology. So, um, the word dwarf is acceptable. It's a, it, um, but we generally avoid it when describing a person, a little person, short in stature and average height um, are things that we would use. Midget is extremely highly offensive. Um, it derives from the freak show era where people with dwarfism were you, like, we used as objects to stare at and laugh at. Um, and it's difficult because the things that I've found out since becoming a mom is there's a lot of books that still use that terminology. It's a lot of rolled R books that are discussed in school. So there's lots of things to think about as, as Ella grows older. I'm going to put a video on now um, and just a bit of a trigger warning. There is quite there is some swearing. So if um, you might get offended, you might want to mute this bit. Oh, if it'll work. Okay. Is it all in proportion? Where's your mum? How's the weather down there? Fucking a dwarf on my bucket list. <laughs> Good luck with that. It <laughs> won't be me. Can I have a photo? Uh, no. Is the answer to that? You know what it's about. Is that all that? <gasps> I see the dwarf. But what makes me laugh is when they try and take a secret one. One of them little sneaky things that I see they're doing on the tube like oh, that. Oh, I hate that one. Right. 
and the flash comes on. I know, yeah. <laughs> and it's going, excuse me? They've got no control over it, no control over the discussion about it. Why are you taking a photo of me? I was taking a photo of the floor. Where you? Where's your mum? I'm in town with my mates, walking around, going to the shops. I'm like, people come up and they go, are you okay? Where's your mum? People come like electrician people to the doors like, is your mum in? I used to work with, with children, with preschool children. And when we used to go out on outings and that, I used to dread it. Because the staff used to always huddle me in. I heard of friends who've gone into a restaurant with family or something and they've been given a child's menu. Fucking a dwarf is on my bucket list. Oh no. <laughs> what do you want me to say after that? Oh, of course you can. <laughs> Come on. No. We're not possessions or people. Like, it's not like we're a task. I think it's generally to like show off to their mates mm. usually. They'll say like, bloody hell, I could, I could swing you from the chandelier. That's why my love life is just shambles. Because, because everyone's just like bucket list. <laughs> you get the ones that want to be pen pals, you get the ones that just want to screw you because you're short, and then you get the ones that are actually a bit more open-minded, a bit more decent. Yeah. I'm yet to find those ones. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just surrounded by the other two. Oh yeah, I've never been with a, a guy your height or whatever. Okay. And then yeah, sometimes I, if I like them, I might just go, <laughs> go with the flow. <laughs> <laughs> Oompa, loompa, oompa dee doo. Do I look like I'm orange? <laughs> yeah. Do I look like I have green hair? The oompa loompas, they're like creatures, aren't yeah. they? And we're not creatures, we're people. Mini me used to be a massive one. <laughs> oh, look, it's mini me. Oh, look. I'm not mini me, I'm not a bold man. Is it all in proportion? Now, I've had a lot of people ask me to like, like, um, see how big my penis is. I've never seen another guy's knob, so I don't know. Whack it out yeah. later. Do you want to have a look? Pfft, there you go. Do you want to compare? Even from my friends, they're just so, um, they're like down there, you know, is everything all right? I've had someone ask me if I can have sex. Yeah. And I'm like, well, everything's functioning, yeah. so, um, it makes it better because <laughs> you don't get the same angle, you get different angles. Yeah. That's like, true, yeah. you don't expect, like, rather than like the average bloke might be coming like that and I'm coming like that she hits the spot mm -hmm. so so she, so she says oh can I pick you up do I look like a trophy have, have I got handles have I got hand do I look like an FA cup you could try to pick me up but it'd be pretty difficult mm. to pick me up because I'm like quite heavy people don't realize you just want to have fun and you know go out with your friends or whatever and then people are like trying to pick you up someone will just grab you and pick you yeah. up almost like you know bear hug you yeah. like that yeah. and when you're like that your arms out you can do nothing about it, and it's no, quite. Exactly, it's, it can yeah. be scary. It can it? be scary. At one point, somebody was like, you know, doing the Lion King thing, and they were like Simba, and I was like, I just felt so embarrassed. My worst experience was when um, a group of like school kids picked me up and oh. they put me in like an industrial bin. Oh shit! And then locked me in there. Stood on a bar stool to reach for something, and someone literally touched me in between my crotch. I was promoting for a strip club, mm -hmm. and then I was talking to these group of lads, and I felt something in my leg. And I was like, what the fuck is that? And like, this, this kid had his knob out and he was like, he was, to be fair, he was quite, he wasn't that close to me. He was like, like a few uh, meters away, but he was like pissing on my leg. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, what the, the fuck? Pit. I was like, I let, like taking the piss, literally. <laughs> I hate this word. Midget. Nah, don't do it. Don't say it. Like, it makes us sound like a creature, yeah. in a way. The word midget comes from a circus performing person of proportionate height. Yeah. And we're not clowns. When I was growing up, I never knew the different, which was more hurtful. The N-word or the M-word, because I got both. It's always like, oh you fucking midget, yeah. look at you, you midget. It's alright people taking the mic and having their little moment of fun, but there's some things that actually log in with us and they never ever leave us. So you know, it just just to bear some things in mind, it's you know, your little five minutes of joking is a lifetime of memory for us, people like us. Do you ever wish you were taller? Most people with dwarfism, when they're a child, they think, oh, I wish I was taller, kind of thing. But as I've grown into an adult, and probably the same for you, I love it. My mum always says to me, she always goes that I'm four foot two, but I've got a personality of 10 foot. I just imagine it, but I don't wish it, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. I'd be lying if I said I hadn't 
thought certain things would yeah. be easier if I yeah. was. Going to the shop and you can reach the top shelf, yeah. you know, that's like a dream, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I love the person who I am. I would never change. Mm. But I think just to experience it, so just you want to see what it's like. Step outside, have a look and go, nah. <laughs> <laughs> We're so different to the world and it brings so many positive things that average height people would wish to have. Some of it is like you're a little mini celeb kind of thing. <laughs> I've done the work like Panto, which I love so much. Like I've been a model. So I've played bands around the world. I was Britain's smallest bodybuilder and um, I think I still am. There's people's attitudes, that's what needs to change. Amongst anything else, it's people's attitudes, because if that changed, then that will stop all the phones, all the mickey taking, all the staring. Then that's like the top of the hill, really, people's attitudes. And yeah, change that and then we're the perfect world. So, implications on practice when working with children and families. So, whether or not you're working with um, families with disabilities, I think this journey is actually quite interchangeable. I remember asking somebody from my management group to um, listen to it before I started presenting it. She said it actually reminded her of how she felt um, when she was going through cancer treatment. I think you can take bits of the journey, lessons learned, services needed and relate it to anybody that you're working with, whether that be you're a social worker like me or you're in HR or you're a lecturer. Um, I became a service user overnight and it is overwhelming and it's scary. Um, it reminded me that we need to be informed about key issues. Uh, we need to know where to sign post families to. I think if I'd been referred to the London consultant straight away, it would have reduced my stress by 75%. Um, do what we say we're going to do when we say we're going to do it. Um, I've become a serial complainer. It's a joke within my family, but actually it's exhausting. Um, and I constantly say, if I didn't do what I did as a job, would Ella have the services that she has? I don't think she would. Um, the use of appropriate language, know what it is and show empathy and advocate for your families. As I said, you know, I think if I was less confident, less educated, English was a second language, would I have the things that I have? Then these are just points to consider if you are working with children and families. So this is a poem a lot of people sent me and sometimes it touched me and other times it just made me want to swear. But actually it's really accurate and I'm, I'm going to read it out. So when you're going to have a baby, it's like planning a fabulous vacation trip to Italy. You buy a bunch of guidebooks and you make your wonderful plans. The Colosseum, the Michelangelo David, the gondolas in Venice. You may learn some phrasy hands and um, phrases in Italian. It's all very exciting. After months of eager anticipation, the day finally arrives. You pack your bags and off you go. Several hours later, the plane ends. The stewardess comes and says, welcome to Holland. Holland, you say? What do you mean, Holland? I signed up for Italy. I'm supposed to be in Italy. All my life, I've dreamed of going to Italy. But there's been a change in the flight plan. They've landed you in Holland and that's where you must stay. The important thing is that you haven't been taken to a horrible, disgusting, filthy place with famine and disease. It's just a different place. So you must go out and you must buy a new guidebook and you must learn a whole new language and you'll meet a whole new group of people you would have never met. It's just a different place. It's slower pace than Italy, less flashy than Italy, but after you've been there for a while and you catch your breath, you look around and you begin to notice that Holland has windmills and Holland has tulips. Holland even has the Rembrandts. But everyone you know is busy coming and going from Italy. And for the rest of your life, you'll say, yes, that's where I was supposed to go. And that's what I had planned. But if you spent the rest of your life mourning the fact you didn't get to Italy, you may never be free to enjoy the very special and very lovely things about Holland. So I think that poem pretty much sums up where we are now as a family. I feel like we're in the acceptance stage. 
I read this quote and I think it sums it up very well. Grief comes in waves and it can feel like nothing will ever be right again. But gradually, most people find that the pain eases and it's possible to accept what's happened. You will get used to your new life and it will become the new norm. There's so many things that we've done um, since Ella's been born and we've had the right support. So I've gone back to the Princess Royal and I've spoken to them about the way we were treated as a family. I have done um, articles on the internet for Wolverhampton City Council. We've set up a soft play event for other parents and their children who are under five. Um, Ella's done a charity photo shoot. She's currently the face for the Christmas campaign um, for New Life Charity. Um, as with all parents, our goal is to ensure that Ella has a safe, happy and fulfilling childhood and that she grows up to be confident and independent. Um, and we want to celebrate her differences. We don't ever just want the, the focus to be on the contraplasia. Um, we try and urge people to treat her for her age and her developmental level and not her size. And we're still learning. You know, some of the medical issues still cause me fear and anxiety. Um, I still have concerns about society. Um, her emotions growing up with peer pressure to fit in. I think it's hard enough being a teenager in today's society without um, having something that makes you stand out. Um, and also really worry about her brothers getting into fights at school, <laughs> sticking up for her, because there are three of them. Uh, I still have things to work on myself. I think I've survived the journey by eating. <laughs> um, I really need to start working on my self-care but I'm definitely becoming who I am again and enjoying being a mother to Ella. And so what now for Ella? So this is a list of the things we'll be doing um, over the next year or so. Um, she's truly amazing. She's stubborn, she's funny, she's bright. She's absolutely smashing her milestones. And we've got a whole community of people that we would have never met that have become like a second family. And we're really fortunate for the kindness of strangers upon our journey. And I really hope to pay that forward to others in my situation, which is one of the reasons why I've been going around doing this presentation. Dancing the cha cha. Ellie Simmons and Akita Kutzman. final message to everyone involved is that people with dwarfism can do anything we can do they just might need some adaptions I think it's really important to find somebody's strengths and focus on these to encourage their resilience and empower them to feel confident and secure within their own skin as an individual I think there'll be ongoing issue um, ongoing access issues to counselling that um, people will need, whether it's the young person or us as a family, um, because there will be times when it's socially and emotionally difficult um, because of what was said before my presentation about society needing to change really. Um, so my questions to you are following on from what you've seen and heard today, what will your three pledges be to take into your work and everyday lives? And can you have a think about them and think about how it will impact you and your practice. It might be something really simple, just sharing one fact you've learned today with one other person. 
because if everybody did that, think how much knowledge we provide to the local community and society. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you so much, Laura, for what was a really fascinating presentation. I think that the chat function wasn't necessarily working before, but I'm assured it is working now. So if anybody does have a question they want to ask, please do share. I can see um, Adam Vasco, our um, director of, of one of our faculties here at um, the University for Equality and Diversity. I said, thank you for sharing, Laura, your story is inspiring. I have to challenge myself to not say your strength. You have a beautiful baby, <laughs> Ella is boss. <laughs> My question is, um, you could leave us, if you could leave us with one piece of advice to become more disability confident, what would it be? I think it's taking the time out of your everyday life to just have more awareness. So I know before I had Ella's diagnosis, uh, you know, you're busy with work and you're busy with everyday life and you, you're plodding on doing your thing. And I think I, I never really considered the impact that society has on certain people. I think I knew that um, if you had a physical disability and something that could be seen, um, there would be issues that you would be facing, but I never knew the ins and outs. So for example, if you said to me, oh, my child's got dwarfism, I probably would have been very simplistic about it, thought, oh, they're, they're short. But actually there's so much more that's involved with that. Um, emotionally, physically, and from an access point of view. Um, so it's just taking that time, I think. That's great. I think something that really resonated with me was, you know, you're talking about disability as, as being a difference, but it doesn't have to be a disadvantage. No. And that's something, I think, a really clear message that we're wanting to get across as part of the work that we're doing at the university, and particularly in the work we're doing to create an institutional um, charter for our disabled staff. It's that idea of the affirmation model of disability, that disability doesn't need to be medicalized all the time, um, but we do need to make sure that we are appreciating that, you know, it may mean a difference, but that difference doesn't have to be a negative thing. And actually there are so many advantages that being diverse offers us as a community uh, and disability is no exception to that. And I think that that's a really important message to share. And I think we can think ourselves about whether we engage in microaggressions that sometimes could cause offence, whether it's terminology we use and how the impact that can have on somebody if that's internalised. And that's an important message, I think, for everybody as well. Um, if anybody has any further um, questions they would like to share in the chat or in the question and answer section, please do so now so that um, Stephanie's has said, thank you, Laura, you shared some very thought provoking insights. And I think another thing that you shared that really struck a chord with me was this idea that of having to fight all the time you know, and how labour intensive that is, having to fight for support, having to fight for, for information. And actually, as an institution and as a sector, we need to be making sure that we are supporting our disabled staff and making it possible to have reasonable adjustments. And, you know, as line managers being as empathetic and supportive as we can be to ensure that individuals that, and colleagues that have disabilities don't have to fight, you know, don't have to invest all this extra energy and time in order to be able to be the best versions of themselves at work. Um, I, think I think it is that like I obviously I would have still I think we would have still gone through the grief process um, but I think if we had actually had more information it would have been like like I said 75% less mm -hmm. it, it's that it's the it's the not knowing they're not having the information, um, being aware as a society. Yeah, very much so. We've got another question that's come through from Julia Clark asking, what is the most unexpected thing that you've learned about yourself? Oh. <laughs> um, I think I knew that I could advocate because of my job. Um, but it's really shown me how so much of a pain in the ass I can be. <laughs> and you have to be, you have to be a complete pain. You have to phone every day. You need to bang the drum because unfortunately, and it shouldn't be like this, but it is who shouts loudest. And it, that, that shouldn't be how it is. But unfortunately at the moment, that is how it is. Um, and I think 
going through this journey and like being here today like I would have never um, been going around doing presentations before if you'd asked me to do it as part of my job I would have had that absolute fear you know the, the sweatiness the, the anxiety um, but it's about it's about having that confidence really to go and present and to support yeah absolutely um, we've got another message as well from Paula who says thanks so much Laura such a privilege to hear about your family's journey. I will take that, what you've said on board in my new role in widening participation at the university. And I think I'll probably finish really by saying that actually it's really interesting that, you know, you described getting so much information from families of individuals that had the condition already. And I think that's something that we can, um, we can take from this as well in that often if you're a line manager and you're working with a member of staff that has a disability, you're not going to be really familiar with that disability. It's not going to be something you know lots about, but actually that person's the expert of their condition. And it's okay to have those discussions. We did a recent podcast with Phil Greystock at the university here, and he was talking about as a line manager, you're going to have to sometimes have conversations that take you out of your comfort zone, but there's nothing wrong with having conversations with staff and asking them to, to educate and to explain so that, you know we're not ignorant or so that we don't make mistakes and we can work together and I think it's so valuable to be able to draw on the knowledge of others who have similar conditions or to ask the individual themselves to share those um, thoughts so that we can you know best identify the way to support each other. It will um, it will be much appreciated as well nine times out of ten that person will really appreciate that and will it will they'll feel better. Yeah absolutely Thank you so much, Laura. Adam has asked whether you'll be happy to come and do a podcast. He's doing a podcast series at the moment. What will make oh, the boat go faster? Yeah. Looking at kind of diversity within our organisation. He says he'd like to continue the discussion with you. So you might be receiving an email from him tapping you up for a podcast. Julian, I don't know if you have any further thoughts you want to add. Um, am I muted? No, you're, I can hear no, you. No, no, I just thought the, the overriding thing I got from there, just to add to everything that Mel's just said, is that, you know, is we, we always think of disability in terms of like people living tragic, lonely lives. And it's just really wonderful and heartwarming to see that Ella's living a really rich and fulfilling life. And she's like, what, you know, she's embracing, she's loved, not just by, you know, her, 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 you, her family, but also friends in the community as well. And it's like a really positive, you know, image of how we sort of like positively embrace disability within our society. Yeah. And that, that is the exact message that I want to get over. So I'm really glad that you said that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Disability does not equal disadvantage. I'm just writing in the chat and it absolutely does not. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us and for sharing your story, your journey. Um, I've been trying fun. to um, I've been trying to um, share my link to get feedback, but for some reason it won't let me put it in the chat. If I send it to you, Mel, will you do that for me, please? Yeah, Thank you absolutely. very much. No problem at all. And um, to everybody else that's in the room, we've got the next session starting at half past 11 and I'm going to be leading a discussion on where are we at the university at the moment and where are we in relation to the institutional charter that we're creating and why is this significant, significant for us. I've already shared in the chat the link for Eventbrite, so if anybody hasn't signed up for that and is available, you can find the information there and we hope that you've enjoyed this session and can attend more of the sessions today or other ones advertised on the Disability History Month website. Thank you all and hopefully see you in one of the next sessions today.